今後人類の未来は科学の発展と人類の精神的進化のバランスが取れて初めて安定したものになるであろうと確信をいたしておりますこの京都省はこの両面の今後の発展に大きく寄与し新しい哲学的パラダイムの構築を促進するいささかの刺激剤となればこの上なく幸せに思っております。The Kyoto Prize is Japan's highest private award for lifetime achievement in the fields of advanced technology, basic sciences, and the arts and philosophy. Given by the Inamori Foundation, the Kyoto Prize is presented to individuals and groups worldwide who have contributed significantly to the betterment of mankind. The Inamori Foundation and UC San Diego share similar missions. We are both committed to scientific progress. We are both committed. To cultural advancement, and we are both committed to solving complex issues through multidisciplinary research. World renowned faculty from our two institutions have worked together across multiple disciplines to forward scientific discovery. Together, we are driving innovations in science, innovations in medicine, and innovations in technology. Thank you, Chancellor Koswa. Hello, everyone. I'm Al Pisano, the Dean of the Jacobs School of Engineering here at UC San Diego, and I am pleased to present UC San Diego nanoengineering professor Darren Lapomi, who is the perfect person to introduce Ching W. Tong, the 2019 awardee of the Kyoto Prize in Advanced Technology. I'll give Darren Lapomi the full honor of a full introduction of Professor Tong, but first, I'd like to share a bit of information about Professor Lapomi himself. Darren is a world leader in thin film electronic materials. Like many high impact engineers, he engages in the virtuous cycle between fundamental and applied research. Applications of his work include solar energy and artificial touch. I could get into many details of his many awards, accolades, and accomplishments, but in the few moments I have, I'd like to highlight an important critical aspect of Darren's work as an engineering professor. Darren creates inclusive. Research and learning environments for his students, both inside and outside the lab. He is the incoming faculty director of the IDEA Engineering Student Center here at the Jacobs School. And in addition to all this and all the other things he does, he facilitates important STEM conversations, including many. That are related directly or indirectly to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And he does this through his podcast, which is called Molecular Podcasting with Darren Lapomi. Without further ado, I present you Professor Darren Lapomi. Good evening. My name is Darren Lapomi, a member of the faculty at the Department of Nanoengineering and Chemical Engineering program at UC San Diego. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ching W. Tong, the 2019 recipient of the Kyoto Prize in Advanced Science and Technology. So, Professor Tong is currently a professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and an emeritus professor of chemical engineering at the University of Rochester. He was born in 1947 in British Hong Kong. He holds a BS in chemistry from the University of British Columbia and a PhD in physical chemistry from Cornell in 1975. He had a long and extraordinarily productive career at the Eastman Kodak Company between 1975 and 2006 and was at the University of Rochester from 2006 onward. 
He is the recipient, as we are celebrating here, of the Kyoto Prize in 2019. He is a member of the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2018. He is the winner of the Wolf Prize in Chemistry in 2011. He was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering in 2006, and he has been a fellow of the American Physical Society since 1998, and was recently awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the University of Rochester. This is Professor Tong's Google Scholar page, and you'll notice two papers here. He's actually being uh, awarded the Kyoto Prize for the discovery of organic light emitting devices. What this uh, paper basically shows is that if you take an organic emitter and you sandwich it between indium tin oxide and, uh, and magnesium and silver uh, electrodes and apply a voltage, you can get light to come out of this organic semiconductor. And the organic light emitting device is the basis for much of commercial organic optoelectronics applications in consumer electronics, IT devices, also automotive applications, and devices for very high efficiency indoor lighting. I have always been uh, quite impressed by uh, the fact that Professor Tong had not only the invention of the OLED under his belt, but also the invention of the OPV, or the Organic Photovoltaic Device. If you look now, devices that incorporate organic semiconductors, so or pure organic materials in the red here, and perovskite hybrid organic materials in the uh, the red and yellow here. These are solar cells that, uh, that are not as efficient as the solar cells you might find in uh, high uh, efficiency satellite or aerospace applications, but in terms of cost per efficiency, they're actually very, very good, and Professor Tong has a place in the history of the development of such devices. This is a photo that was taken at a lab in at the Danish Technical University in Denmark where they took organic photovoltaic devices and they printed them like newspaper and then applied them to very large areas. So this work is still um, ongoing. I was actually there and, uh, and saw them do this and it's really just a testament to the impact of Professor Tong's work. As long as I have your attention, I might as well tell you a little bit about my own work and how it was influenced by Professor Tong. So I study the mechanical properties and mechanical toughness of organic semiconductors of the type developed by Professor Tong. We're interested in particular in making solar devices for developing world and disaster relief and military and intelligence applications, and also in integrating these devices with biological tissue. So in summary, I would like to congratulate Professor Tong for his being awarded the 2019 Kyoto Prize in Advanced Technology. Thank you. I would like very much to thank the Inamari Foundations for giving me such a deep honor. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the evolution of OLED display technology. OLED stands for Organic Light Emitting Dials. In many ways, um, it's the journey of my life. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm from the Hong Kong University in Science and Technology. Um, I've been there for five years. So my own revolution, just very briefly. I came from Hong Kong. Hong Kong is in the south of China. It's a very small place, measuring 20, meter, uh, 20 miles by 20 miles. Um, Hong, Hong Kong, as you know it, as most of you know it, uh, is a very bustling city. It's a city of lights beautiful lights in the, at night. But Hong Kong in the last couple of months is very chaotic in turmoil. I'm sorry to say that, but I would like to ask for your support and understanding of the Hong Kong situation. And I also would like you to come to visit, the, if not now, in the near future. 
I came from a town in the northwest part of Hong Kong called Yunnan. And in the 50s, Yunnan was quite a bustling town. The main street, as you see here, was lined up with shops, restaurants. The villagers from nearby villagers would come there uh, to enjoy the morning tea or sell their goods. And that's the place where I grew up. I actually grew up in the village the nearby. And today, I moved to the, the east, the southeast. Uh, to a university is only 25 years old and, uh, and continue to do my research there uh, in organic LED and other subjects. So, the, my village, and this is my, uh, the, the, the house built my, by my grandfather in 1921, almost a hundred years ago. It's still standing there. And the reason it was standing there because it was made of very good materials, the bricks. The bricks was actually made in the kiln that uh, owned by my grandfather. So he probably chose the best bricks and built the best house for himself and his family. And that's why it's still standing today. And nearby, the, my, we call it our old house, uh, it's the village shrine. Uh, it's a one room, the building, with a very small room attached to it. The small room is a one room schoolhouse where I first have my first taste of education, five year old. And I probably spent a few months there learning very simple Chinese. But that's how I started in my education pathway. Uh, so my early education, I went to a primary school um, from 1953 to 59. The school was built in 1951. And my father, who is very influential in the town, particularly in education matters, that was responsible for the founding father or members of the school board. So he was a very important person to the community and also a very important person to me. But he also had very wild connections. And as you can see here, he was with Richard Nixon, the Vice President of the United States. I don't know how that he could invite the Vice President of the United States to visit his primary school in a remote place in Hong Kong. Um, he was pointing to Richard Nixon. I think he was telling him what to do at that moment. I'm not so sure. But my family has very special connection with the President of the United States. Not only my father had a chance to meet with the, president, the, the Vice President who later became the President of the United States. And here is my son. He had a chance to meet with President Obama. That was in 2011, when Obama was running for re-elections. I'm sure my son has something to do with his being re-elected. Again, I'm not so sure. The only the person, the, so my father's generation, my son's generation had a chance to connect with the, the president of the United States, but my generation, no. So moving forward, uh, after leaving Hong Kong, I went to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, to study chemistry, and where I had the opportunity to do research and beginning to do research with Professor Ogrislaus. I, I, I don't know how got me, I got into research, but I was very interested in building things. The, I was very proud of myself to build a 
piece of equipment out of grass, doing grass growing all by myself. So I thought I would, you know, the, I could make a living as a grass grower, but I'm glad I didn't do it. Uh, I move on to higher education. So after three years, I move on to Cornell University uh, to study physical chemistry under Professor uh, A.C. Albrecht, and we call him Andy Albrecht. Of course, I learned of, of sciences from him. He's an expert in molecular spectroscopy. So I, I learned a little bit of spectroscopy, some solid sort of state physics, and, uh, in, uh, and under his uh, uh, directions. But he really did not direct me to do experiments. He just there for me to ask questions, if I need to ask questions. He's trying to train you to be independent researchers. But most importantly, he taught me how to be a good human being, the humanity. And with a strong tilt towards liberal, the uh, liberalism. So he taught me to read the New York Times. He's probably the most liberal newspaper in the world. Um, then I went to Kodak uh, right after the graduate school. I spent 31 years there. And as you can see from this picture, I really enjoy my work. And I was quite happy there. And uh, after 31 years at the Kodak, I moved on to academia. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to uh, become a faculty member in the Department of Chemical Engineering in the University of Rochester, and then following that, coming to Hong Kong uh, to be with the Institute for Advanced Studies at the Hong Kong University in Science Technology, where I'm still there now. So, that was my very quick personal evolutions. Now I'm going to tell you the evolution of display technologist. So in this diagram, the horizontal axis is the year, starting from 1950 to 2030, projecting into the future. And then on the vertical axis is the dimension of the display in inches the diagonal of the display. So the small display can be as small as less than one inch, and the big display, like this one, can be hundreds of thousands of, of inches. So in the 1950s, all we had were uh, cathode tubes, big boxes. And that technology, kind of last almost like 50 years, and until 1990 or so. The people want to have bigger, bigger televisions, but then they're getting heavier and heavier and heavier. You cannot even get into a small apartment. So the technology has to be replaced. And also, at the time, there was an evolution in computing. So portable computing uh, is very important. So we had to come up with a technology that allow you to be portable. So that's where the fat panel display come in. So the CLT become obsolete, and then the fat panel display start coming in. And there's multiple, there's quite a few fat panel display technology. All I'm going to talk here is this, the LCD. So the LCD can be mixed more and also can be made very large. For the small one, they were used for the cell phones, the laptops, below 10, the, you know, between the several inches to tens of inches. And they can also make very large TVs, typically on the order of 55 inches, 65 inches, or even bigger. So I, I put it, say, below 100 inches. And OLED, which come in about 2010, so that's about almost you know, 20 years after the LCD. Uh, it became, it, the, the technology can be used for both the small display 
as well as the big display, just like the LCD. So OLED really was here to compete with the LCD because LCD is already existing. And um, as I will tell you later on in my talk, the competition is going quite well for OLED. And OLED has also another feature, which is that it can be folded, it can be rolled, and so on, even the curve. So it has a form factor which allow you uh, to, uh, for newer applications, like something that you can wear, like the watch and the other display as well. More recently, just in the last year or two, there's another technology that, that came uh, along, and that is called the micro LED uh, limiting dial. And this is based on inorganic gallium nitride, the materials. And that technology, because you can tile the display together without the seams, and so it can make as large as you like as you can afford to pay for it. And that display technology, the one at the upper corner there, almost have no limit in size. So they can go to 1,000 inches, more than 1,000 inches, but, um, but they cannot go small. So the, at least not now. So, we, so OLED and LCD can compete very well against each other, and we don't have to worry about the micro LED competing in the small dimension displays. So because CRT is such an important technology, even though it was obsolete now, I want to just uh, briefly mention you know, how the discovery came about. Uh, first of all, there is a discovery of electrons by J.J. Thompson back in 1985. And he was given a Nobel Prize in 1905 because of that. Just imagine discovering the electron, which we use for the electricity today. And then a few years later, Carl Braun used the electron to hit a screen that has a phosphor on it, and so that you can produce an image on the screen. And that's how the CRT2, or the modern TV, uh, was the, the first discovered. So he won a Nobel Prize in 1909, but not for the display that he invented, but for a telegraph. So you can see if you're smart, you can do many things and still get a Nobel Prize. So that was the CRT. So the problem with CRT is that it's very heavy and very thick just because the, the technology uh, was based on one electron gun. In other words, you have one addressing element for all the picture elements we call pixels on the screen. And the screen can have million pixels, but you have only one gun. So the gun has to be directed to the screen using a magnetic field or electric field. So in this CRT technology, the thickness is proportional to the screen size and the weight proportional to the screen size. And so the limitation, the is that it cannot be scaled to large uh, the, 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 the screens. And here comes the fat panel display technologies. The difference there is that for each addressing element, you have one pixel. So you can compact them into a flat screen, as shown in this diagram on the right here. So the thickness of the screen can be only a few millimeters. In fact, the, for OLED, it can be less than one millimeter, and that's why it can be rolled. All right. So this is the, literally a revolution rather than evolution in display technology, going from the big and fat and heavy to thin and light. So the LCD, was the dominant technology in the fat panel displays. It was discovered for the display technology. LCD is known for a long time, but for display applications, it was first discovered in RCA laboratories in the 1960s. First, by Williams, he basically observed that if you apply a voltage 
to LCD liquid, uh, it can get cloudy uh, if you apply voltage to it. And when we remove the voltage, it can be transparent. So just a you know, optical phenomena, but you can distinguish whether it's light passing through or not pa passing through. And a few years later, uh, George Hellmeyer that took that inventions and make a clock out of it. And that's the first uh, LCD clock that he made. And he's, uh, that is him in the 1970s, I suppose. The, for, his, for this invention, he was given the 2005 Kyoto Prize, just to make the connections. So the evolution of uh, LCD took 50 years, as you can see in this timeline chart. It started with Williams and Hellmeyer's the discovery in the 60s. And there's other important discoveries, uh, like the twist pneumatic uh, the liquid crystals by Martin Shade and uh, Helfrich uh, in the seven, 1973, I believe. And then the active matrix backplane using amorphous silicon, the, also in the 70s. And around the end of 70 was the beginning of OLED. So we were behind by about, uh, you know, more than 15 years. And then after that, you have the display development, uh, you have the, the one important uh, uh, milestone was the development of the blue LED by Nakamura, uh, Akasaki, and uh, Amano. The three of them won the Nobel Prize a couple years ago for that discovery. And because you have the blue LED, you also can have the white, and so therefore they can use the LED as the backlight for LCD, and that was very important. And after that, there's different uh, LCD uh, display technologies, but mostly uh, important but minor variations. The important development was that about the 2010, the Chinese in China beginning to make huge investment in LCDs, and the price drops as a result. And today, uh, you can get a 65 inches LCD, at least in the United States, for about $500. So it's very inexpensive for a large uh, uh, entertainment uh, technologies. So roughly that was the timeline of LCD. So you have some key developments, and also you have huge investment to drive the price down. So, the evolution of OLED. This is mainly to challenge LCD, uh, because LCD is quite a good technology and it worked quite well uh, for display. Uh, but it also has drawbacks. Otherwise, we'd not be able to overtake them. So what's the major difference between LCD and OLED display? So this is a picture of uh, LCD, there are stack arrangements. It has multiple layers. The key is the LC layer in the middle. The way you apply the voltage, uh, it can turn the light, I mean, it's a shutter, so you can let the light go through or you can shut it off. So it's, LCD is a shutter, and you need a backlight, and the shutter is to shut off the backlight. And you have the other layer. The one important layer is the polarizer. You have two of them in the front and the back. That allow the LCD, the, the LCD to act as a shutter. So one of the major drawbacks is that the light is always on, the backlight, at least for the prior generation of the LCD. The newer generation, they can turn the backlight on and off depending on demand. All right, but we can, uh, uh, don't have to, con to, to be concerned with that for now. But the biggest problem is that when you turn off the LCD, some light can still leak through, okay? It's not a 100% shutter. And this little amount of light that leaks through 
can degrade the image quality of the TV quite significantly. In other words, they cannot achieve a perfect black. For OLED, it's a light emitter. It has, at, at least conceptually, we only require two layers plus two electro and a support substrate. When you turn on the voltage, allow the current to, to pass through it, it the LED, the, the, the device produces light. Okay, so when you turn it off, the light is off. So the contrast ratio, we call it the native contrast ratio, can be infinite, practically infinite. But the LCD, at best, may be a thousand or a few thousands. And that is a difference. But that is enough that your eye can tell the, the quality between the two this way. And this OLED stands for organic limiting diodes. So where's the organic coming from? So the traditional, conventional, the, the, the limiting diode is based on inorganic semiconductors, as you can see in the picture on the left. Basically a point light source coming from a very tiny chip, you know, tens of micron on the square. So it's a point light source. It's a crystalline inorganic semiconductor. Uh, the application is for lighting, backlight for LCD, and also for the billboards. It's very the, the defined application there. For the organic LED, uh, it's an area light source instead of a point source. Uh, it's made of amorphous organic film films. It can be used in smartphones, televisions, and variable watches. So the so real difference is that you can process the organic LED um, in an area. So that's why it's very suited for uh, TV and flat panel display applications. And the fact it can be turned on and off uh, very quickly uh, is also a very important feature. So today's OLED display the products ranging from televisions. You can buy 88 inches 8K televisions from LG for a human, for a very high price. Uh, there's also laptop made of uh, OLED the, the display, the tablet, and the most important application, it turned out, is in the cell phones. Uh, you also have application in the watches, the AR and VR applications there as well. So from this figure, you can tell that OLED covers a very broad range of application. And that is one of the reasons it can be successful, just like the LCD. If you are only able to do the large area, or only to able to do the small area, or only able to do one color, then you cannot cover such a wide range of applications. And on top of that, OLED has a very unique quality, which is, you know, the display quality is excellent. <laughs> so, in 2013, the television was first introduced, the OLED TV. And this was me the, in front of uh, LG's the television. I, I'm not a salesman for LG. It just so happened that I was in a store in Hong Kong and uh, they first introduced it. So I just went down there and got the, the, took a look at the TV and uh, got a picture taken there as well. The price at the time was more than $10,000 when it was first introduced. But today, at least in the US market, you can get the same television for about $1,000. So it's the effect of 10 uh, reductions in price over the last uh, six years, which is quite remarkable for a display technology. And we look forward to further reduction in price uh, in the OLED uh, product in the future. So I want to show you what is in the future. And this is uh, LG commercials, uh, they, they loan it to me. Uh, you can see a display coming out from a box. That is the box, and it's, the display is coming out at a push a button.
This is particularly good if you have a beautiful window in your bedroom or in your living room, and you just place that box right in front of your window, and you can look outside if you don't want to watch a TV, and then you can raise the TV if you want to, uh, to watch it. The reason you can have this uh, kind of new TV, because OLED is so thin, it can be rolled up. Um, it also, OLED, because of thinness, it can be folded. So the, 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 the foldable phone in the market now, uh, which you know, sold by Samsung and uh, Huawei, uh, maybe a few others. So these two are products today, but they are kind of expensive. So now I'll go back a little bit to tell you more, a bit more about the discovery of OLED. Um, the OLED was based on electroluminescence. The early work was done back in the 60s, just like the LCD. And in this paper here, published in 1965, the, the device was made of a emphysine crystals sandwiched between the two electrodes here. And if you apply a voltage on the order of 2,000 volt, you can get a very small current on the order of 10 to the minus 5 amp per square centimeter, very small. But you can still see light coming out. And that's proof that the recombination of the electron coming from the cathode and the positive charge coming from the anode, the recombination would give you light. And this is the evidence of it. And it was a blue light. So the first blue LED is actual organic, not inorganic LED, I think. But it requires high volts and low current, even though the efficiency is high. So there's no applications. There's no practical applications. So here is how I came in. I spent a few years at Kodak when I first joined the research lab to work on organic solar cells. Uh, it was a total failure on organic solar cells in terms of applications. I did not make anything useful. But I did discover something quite important, and that is I can use a two-layer structure, or we call it the PN heterojunction structure, to enhance the photogeneration efficiencies, in other words, the solar cell efficiencies. The reason we could do that is because we have this junction right here. This is an energy level diagram I don't want to get into. That, that if you have anything absorbed in this region, the light absorbed by the materials would create excitons. And the excitons, which is, can be dissociated by these junctions, to separate the charge into holes and electrons, and that be collected in an external circuit. So it was a, a quite remarkable uh, uh, in terms of uh, accomplishment at the time, because I achieved a 1% solar cell efficiencies, even though at the time the solar cell efficiency is more than 10%, uh, based on inorganic semiconductors. But nevertheless, by the proper choice of materials, and with the thickness adjusted to about only 60 nanometer, I can get a very decent uh, device performance. But only drawback is I get a 1% efficiency competing with 10, 20% at a time. So the reason it was so inefficient, because the layer thickness is so thin. It doesn't absorb enough light, and that was the major uh, problem. And I cannot increase the thickness because the transport of charges become a limitation. So I fail, and I move on. So I move on to organic light emitting diode. Based on the same structure, nothing changed. The same structure, almost the identical thicknesses. But now, I inject charges, instead of separating charges, and inject charges into it. The electron from the cathode, the holes, the positive charge from the anode. And the recombination takes place here, just because there's a barrier there that the charge cannot cross over. So they have to recombine. And the region for recombination, it can be so thin. So thinness doesn't matter. 
actually it helps because it requires lower voltages. All right. So because of that, and with proper choice of material, this is very important, proper choice of material. You cannot just randomly choose any material. Uh, you can get very high efficiencies. So with this bilayer structure, very thin films, and I also engineering a very important cathode, magnesium silver, and then you can derive very high efficiencies, the, you know, I would say modest efficiencies, and at a low voltage. And another feature is that the very fast response. So it's perfect almost for display application with this kind of attributes. So this paper was cited over 16,000 times. It's, it's quite remarkable. And just to give a little statistics, you know, so the paper that get published here and then the, the number citation goes up. And the, the regions that cited this paper, that China now, because they have more researchers that they're on this field, and they has the highest station followed by Japan and South Korea and the United States. This kind of reflects the development of the technology in that region. And a year, two years later, after the publication of the, the first paper, uh, I went ahead and come up with a scheme. We called it the dope organic fin films. What I did was that in, the, in somewhere in this the layer here, I introduced or uh, inserted in the layer, which is doped with fluorescent materials. And this fluorescent material would be used to change the color coming out from this the main and middle material that we call the host. And with this scheme here, we can produce green light and red light with high efficiency and maybe even longer lifetime. But we were not able to produce blue light at the time because this host material can only generate green light. But the principle is useful for producing RGB. If you have a blue host, you can produce all three of them. So what my accomplishment, uh, at, at the contribution was somehow to make the electron hole pair recombination to be more or less 100%. So the, every electron has to meet the holes. But then after we combine, you can go through two channels. One is called single channel, another one triple channel. So all my prior work was based on this single channel, which has only 25% uh, efficiency. And that was the major limitations. And I wish I had found some way to utilize these channels, but I didn't. And of course, the, the other efficiency factor I'm not going to get into. The one milestone, another milestone paper that was published in 1999, almost 12 years after I published my uh, first paper. And this by the group from Princeton and the uh, University of Southern California, by these three gentlemen, Bottles, Forrest, and Thompson. What they did is that they were able to use the triple channel, which has 75% uh, the pathway so that together they can collect most of the recombination and turn it into excitons and turn it into light. All right. So they created a pathway forward to have 100% we call it internal quantum efficiency. Every electron that comes in can produce light. And this is a major breakthrough. And that is also the reason why that we have the display technology today. Well, organic LED has some lifetime issues uh, because uh, it is emissive and uh, you, you go through the excited state and not all the excited state will turn into light and some of them can turn into degradation products. And so the OLED can degrade. Uh, you can drastically improve the lifetime uh, without changing the materials. You're just changing the device architecture here we have Professor Junji Kiro from Yamagata Universities coming up with a multi-stack structure, basically stacking the, the, each unit, the all, multiple unit together in a series. So the current going through it, the, it would produce light in each of the unit, and the light would be summed to produce the light to go outside of the device. So this way, you can have little current going through it, but more light at the expenses of higher voltages. 
But this is a key development that enables the current television uh, technologies. So what do we have? We have all the, uh, for the older uh, uh, technology, we have a low voltage drive, high efficiency now, full color using the doping scheme, fundamentally is fast switching, much faster than LCD, high contrast because we can turn it off to have black as black. Uh, we also have wide view angles uh, compared to LCD. Uh, we still have a little problem. The lifetime can be improved a little, but it doesn't prevent the technology to moving forward in commercialization. Like for instance, we use the stack structure to improve the lifetime. So the evolution of display. So we felt confident that we can compete with LCD now. So, oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot the, the sequence, but I'm gonna take you through it. Uh, first, you have the, the iPhone. The iPhone measure about roughly six inches in diagonal. And within the screen, you have eight million uh, pixels, the color pixels, and about 50 million transistors to operate this tiny screen, okay? And each color pixels can be switched on and off rapidly, and therefore you can see the images. And that's how complicated it is. But it all can be done monolithically, and that's why uh, it can be made so cheap. You don't do it one by one. If you take one of the pixels and you blow it up, you find that all the multi-layer structures, your transistors there, the organics is there, and then you have the substrate, which can be plastic, and then you also have an encapsulation la layer to prevent the oxygen and moisture from coming in. That's, why you can, that's how you can protect the, the OLED. And each of the OLED stack, instead of consisting of two layers now, it consists more than like five or six layers. So it's very complicated, all right? And each layer has its own set of materials. And I'm showing here the free emitting material, the red, green, and blue. It may not be the exact structure, but they are kind of complicated in the uh, in molecular design because you have to make sure they emit in the right wavelength and with the right bandwidth and so on. Okay, so there can be as many as 20 molecules, or including the metal electrodes and other in the stack. But they're all done by uh, vapor depositions at this time. So I want to go through some of the, 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 the how we develop the display from very simple one to more complex ones. So back in the 1990s at Kodak, that we said that, okay, we have enough fun with the material development, let's try to make a display out of it. So we tried to make a very simple 100 by 100 display. And that means 10,000 pixels instead of, uh, you know, 8 million pixels. So the simple way to do it is that you evaporate, you have, you prepare the ITO electro on the glass support, you evap, and then you pattern it into rows, and then you put down the organic layer, and then you put down the cathode layer by evaporations, and then you do the lithography to pattern the top cathodes. It's easier said than done because patterning the cathode can disrupt the underlying organic layer. So that was a problem, and the result that we achieved was not that good. The display was very defective, as you can see here. But that was in 1990. So a few years later, I came up with a way of uh, patterning that doesn't require photolithography after we evaporate the organic thin films. We basically put the shadow mask on the, the, the ITO anodes before we deposit all the organic layer and metal layers. So organic layer and metal layer were deposit without the uh, interruptions. And by evaporating the metal from a, a three angles, we can produce a gap here, a gap here, and a gap here and therefore we can isolate the cathode to, to give you the display. And 
pioneer, the tok Tokuho pioneer, took it one step further. They come up with a more elaborate scheme to isolate the cathodes, and they were even more successful. So they go with the, 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 the process, and then they develop the very first um, so a passive matrix OLED that is um, the very first application uh, in order for using OLED display. Motorola use it for cell phone and uh, they also use it for the audios. So these are very simple ones. And now if you, have, you have to move to the more active matrix display so that you can get a higher resolution, larger area and so on. Uh, for, for reason is that if you use the simple passive matrix display, you're only limited to about a few hundred lines. With the active matrix display, what you in, incorporate the transistor with each of the, the OLED pixels, then you can infinitely scale it to 8K, 4K display, and those, that's how the, it, it move on. So the, back in the, the, in the, in the 19, the 90, 99, 2000s, the, we came up with a, a pixel scheme right here that not only the, for driving the older display that gives you a very high uniformity. And so today, uh, in your cell phone, you have seven transistors, one storage capacitor for each pixel. At the time, we only have two transistors and one capacitor. Okay, so technology moving forward. So in Kodak, we had uh, this, uh, we developed the, the display. The first one is the, the five inches. Basically, we want to show it to the manager to impress them that we can actually make display. And we team up with Senyo in this country here to, to make that. They provide the back plane, we provide the, the older technology. And the first product came out a few years later. In 2003, we used it for the phone. But unfortunately, it's very costly to make the display. So it's not a good business. So we had to withdraw that product. Uh, making a product requires many, many people, and this is a small group of people in the research lab, you know, trying to pull this off. And the person who really was in charge of this to drive the commercialization of OLED for, the, um, uh, for Kodak is the Dr. Rajaswani, and I just want to acknowledge him uh, for, the, for his work. So, uh, OLED display, uh, was introduced in the market. Uh, you have the cell phone, you have the TV. Here I want to show you uh, uh, the product that was approached by two major corporations. Uh, one is Samsung, other one is LG. Samsung, here, is very, uh, the display quality is more or less the same. There's not a big difference. The Samsung chose a technology, a, we call it the LTPS, the TFT technology. And they also used shadow masking for patent the RGB side by side. This approach led them to failure. So they commercialized it for maybe a couple of months and they have to put a product out. Simply because it's very difficult to use the patent RGB technology to produce large area display. That patterning is not mature. And so, as a result, they cannot produce panel that are cheap enough to make it. In contrast, LG has no problem that they use a metal oxide technology and then they use RGB using the white OLED, using conventional color filter to produce the color pixels. They take a hit in power consumption, but they can manufacture it. Okay, as a result, they are very successful in manufacturing, and they are the only suppliers, credible supplier of older TV today. All right. So, in very short summary, I want to show you that in the first 20 years, uh, I was very engaged in the material development, starting with my uh, employment at Kodak, the OLED discovery later in that decade. Um, this is the equipment that I use for making most of my devices. Uh, in 1987, the, the first paper was published. 
uh, we make the first the passive matrix display, uh, the one I show you, that didn't look too good. And uh, the other display, the older technology came in, like the Palmer LED. And the Kodak, we also use the old OLED for printing applications. Uh, the triplet emitter that enable 100% efficiencies didn't come in until 1999. And the phone, uh, the first cell phone was about 2000. And then from then on was the display technology development. So in the next 20 years, okay, from 2000 to 2020, so we had the first uh, micro display product, the Kodak camera, the Sony PDA, the first, the the, uh, the so-called the, the smartphone, not the, the the small cell phones, and the first older TV by Samsung by Sony, and then the Samsung decided to mass produce uh, all that for their cell phone uh, applications, and then the TV comes in in 2013, and now the mass production starts in China. So if history is a guy then you will be able to enjoy all the, the, the TV cell phones the, at a lower price in the near future. Okay, this is the, the, the 88 inches the television the, made by LG and this is the rollable one. The, along the way, there's other development by other company as well. So it has been a very fulfilling journey of a personal and scientific discovery for me starting from a village in Hong Kong and uh, ending in a discovery uh, that leading to OLED. Along the way, I had the support of a very free, strong woman. My grandmother, my mother, and my wife. And I also have a wonderful family, and they're all here. Thank you very much. Professor Tong, congratulations and welcome to UC San Diego and the Kyoto Prize Symposium, and thanks so much for chatting with us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You had a remarkable career at Eastman Kodak. In the second half of the 20th century, there were large numbers of famous inventions made at places like Bell Labs, IBM, Xerox PARC, HP Labs, and of course, Eastman Kodak. These inventions really came from basic scientific discoveries. However, today you don't see this kind of productivity from industrial research labs, at least in the physical sciences. Much of the basic science seems to be outsourced to universities. Do industrial research labs still have a role to play in basic material science, or have we got the balance right between university labs and industry? What are your thoughts? Well, when I joined Eastman Kodak Company, um, uh, which was in 1975. Um, the, there were Xerox, Bell Lab, IBM, they all have uh, large research labs. And uh, our choice, the, either going to academics or go to the bigger research labs. Uh, in terms of research, the, you know, the, we thought that uh, in particular, you want to uh, be in the industry career the, with more application in mind, you would, uh, you know, go into the uh, uh, the premier the industrial research lab. So have both the prime and the fundamental the side by side. In the, the research lab, I, I, I joined at the time as 3,000 people. And that, uh, there's a chemistry department, there's a physics department, uh, and there's also a photographic uh, the engineering department uh, and motion department and so on. So I happened to join the chemistry department. So you can see that, uh, that we, we do have, uh, you know, fundamental uh, research at the time. And then I was given the freedom to say, hey, you go and make uh, organic soda cells and do whatever you can, and uh, we have no restrictions. And uh, so the discovery of all that uh, came out of that. Uh, today, I think the, the, the situation is very different. And the, there's no Kodak Research Lab anymore. The Xerox Research Lab is probably disappearing uh, as well. And I don't know much about the IBM the, or the Bell, oh, there's no Bell Lab. <laughs> and then, so, 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 
so I think that the, 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 in terms of uh, material research, the physical science research, the, rather than the electronic the software kind, uh, the development cycle seems to take much longer times. And the industry seems just don't have the, the, the time scale or the, 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 the patience to develop new materials. So that's being pushed to the, the industry, the, in the universities or the smaller startups the, which is spin out from the universities. So I think there's a natural progression for certain part of the uh, certain sciences, but compared to the, the artificial intelligence, the, the Google type or the, the Microsoft, I mean, that branch information, the, the, uh, the intense kind of uh, research. And I, I, I think this, they must have a very large the, the research lab the, in, in that sector there. All right, so they may be the one replacing the IBM and the Kodak and uh, and so on. So I wouldn't say that they they, they because they, once the company is making money, they can say that we can invest in the the the, the, the more basic research. I, I, you know, so like put for instance the quantum computing, the, the AI and uh, and so on, and Google and the Facebook. Uh, they don't know about Facebook, that Google is doing all that. So at the I think it, uh, in some dis discipline, I think it's the right balance. The, the university is doing the, the fundamental share, uh, but also the, 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 I, I know that uh, maybe the, your research office also like to do, ask you to do a, a translational kind of research in the university. <laughs> and uh, so I think uh, it, it, uh, here in Asia is uh, is even more true. I think uh, there's a, a lot of uh, universities that are having uh, uh, are the basis of many startups as well. I, I don't know whether I answer your question, so uh, that's my view. Yeah, that's great, and there are a lot of threads that we can uh, that we can follow there. So you're a chemist, and I'm a chemist, and I wouldn't trade my first language for anything. But sometimes I get jealous of my colleagues who are really good in physics, computer science, and electrical engineering. Uh, since your work is now perhaps most closely associated with the electronics industry, do you ever wish you had a different scientific first language, or would you choose chemistry again, knowing what you know now? Well. I, 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 when I uh, started uh, uh, the, my undergraduate, I, I was debating whether I should go into physics and, or chemistry. So I ended up doing physical chemistry. So it's uh, half and half. <laughs> and, and I think uh, the, the physical chemistry is it, a good boundary. The, you know, you step to the physics side, you can do the engineering. To the, the step to the chemistry side, you can do the material research, and uh, uh, but um, uh, I I I I don't think I would change the the what I the, the had in my education as a chem as a chemist, uh, but I, I I tend to like the more in the physical side. So I felt comfortable talking to the display the experts the, in the LCD field and. The, uh, and I, I know the language, then I uh, uh, sometimes I even understand the circuit design and so on, and uh, you just learn from them. Uh, and uh, uh, it, I think, uh, the, you know, the, I wish I could be deeper in all this discipline, you know, but there's only so much a human mind can do. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and uh, so, so to, to keep, the answer is short. Yes, I, uh, I'm very proud to be a chemist. I would also like to be a physicist. <laughs> That's very self-affirming for, for me to hear. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, why did you move from Kodak to U of R? Uh, would you have stayed if Kodak's finances were better? Wow, that, that is a, a, a uh, agonizing decision that I made uh, at the time the, um, uh, because I, I was uh, uh, with Kodak uh, for 30 some years, 20, you know, 31 years. And um, uh, the decision I made to leave is really based on, I, uh, not that I don't uh, like Kodak. I work very well with my colleagues, with the management. I was valued highly and uh, I have a very small group, you know, maybe five people working with me. Uh, but there's a huge group uh, in the engineering and other side of it. 
And uh, when I made a decision to leave, I uh, really is based on those. Uh, I want to have a change and I want to try something different. And I happen to know somebody uh, in the U of R uh, who I work with and talk to you know, often. And uh, he encouraged me to give a try at uh, academics. And the other thing that I have not tried is uh, uh, to be working in the small startups. So I could have done either. Mm -hmm. uh, but I chose the academic side just to have a different taste and experience. And I, I think that is very, extremely rewarding. And the most uh, of it is that uh, you work with uh, much younger generations. You don't work with your colleague, let's say your, your age and, uh, you know, and they, they seems like uh, there's a, the younger mind, uh, you can have more influence on them, you know? And, uh, and, and, and that is the, 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 the satisfaction uh, in, the, in the academic side. But uh, writing research grant and all those, boy, I wish I want to do is completely different. <laughs> 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 and, and then I enjoy, and then I, I compare to the industry where I don't have to, uh, I don't have a map uh, to uh, to worry about where the money coming from, and, and so on. That that's that's uh, uh, that's the side that I don't like about academics. It's almost they like spend more time to write research proposal than doing research itself. Indeed, I can <laughs> identify. <laughs> so, if you had to advise a young enthusiastic engineer, say coming out of a bachelor's degree program, um, to make an impact in electronic material science, what is the best place to do that? Industry or academia or a startup, or does it depend on the person? I think it really depends on the person. Uh, if you, you know, it, uh, if you wanted to study in the, uh, academics, I mean, academic, uh, I, would, uh, I would advise my students, if you want to go to academic, uh, you, you, you have to deal with if a, uh, a period of time, particularly in the, uh, in the first five, six years where you had to go through your tenure, right? So you have to prove yourself in that, six, at that time. But what if you're a late bloomer? You make your discovery in the seventh year. <laughs> that would not come and choice your that tenure. <laughs> so I, I think that, you know you have to consider all that. Uh, but uh, uh, but if you are uh, uh, really independent, uh, you are you are a, a good thinker and uh, you you you're able to write uh, a good paper. You know, get your thought very clear, and uh, and also. To, uh, enjoy teaching. Academic is a wonderful career. All right, so it's a downside and good side. In the industry, the, if you join a big company like I did in Kodak, you almost uh, the, the, the thought that uh, you would be there for life, at least at the time I joined Kodak, mm -hmm. because there's a stability associated with it. But along the side here, the, it can also make you less. The, competitive because you're so satisfied with your job. <laughs> All right. But if you work in a startup that, that you don't know whether your next paycheck coming from, so you have to work much harder. And uh, so, so my only experience I, I, I lack was it, uh, uh, you know, the working in the startup. So I, 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 I'm pretty sure there's a lot of exciting moments there and also like, uh, some sort of uh, very you know, pressure cooking, pressure cooker moments. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> uh, so I think it really depends on the, 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 the but I think if uh, the engineer or the scientist who actually has a, a firm uh, understanding of the basics and to be able to connect that dots, I don't think that he has to worry about, the, uh, you know, uh, getting a job in the right place. It's not in the right place that we find another one in the, in, the, in, the, in the next company. I mean, you mm -hmm. just have to keep looking, you know? Yeah, that's great. Um, I have one, one last question. See, 
You've worked or studied in three countries, two continents, and multiple geographic areas, uh, snow and sun and everything in between. <laughs> in what way does culture influence choices in scientific research? And you can take that question along any dimension you'd like, fundamental versus applied, science engineering, or some other axis. Well, um, this, uh, it, it being uh, in the like you said, in three continents, multiple countries, and uh, hot and cold weathers. Actually, I like cold weather better than hot weather. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I enjoy my five years in uh, Ithaca working with the uh, Andy Albrecht, uh, who's the, uh, just a great advisor. Um, and uh, I, I think um, what I, uh, by the way, I think uh, you, you, you know that my, my wife is the, uh, uh, non-Chinese, uh, she's Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so I learned that part of the culture as well. So I, I think uh, being uh, with uh, different uh, uh, the kind of the group of people, the Asians, Americans, black and white, yellow, and, and give you a very good perspective that this is a very diverse world, just like in science, it's extremely diverse, you know, beautiful, and also very complicated. <laughs> the human nature is very complicated and science is very complicated. So I think as a human being, the, we, we like to have the tools or have the ability to appreciate and to uh, uh, connect with all these the, the people and environments. And being in different place at different time of your life, it just give you the amazing opportunity uh, to learn and to uh, be a better person, I guess. Wonderful note to end on. Uh, Professor Ching W. Tong, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations again on the Kyoto Prize. Thank you very much. It's very nice to talk with you. この